In verse 1 it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now when you look at Jerusalem uh, on the world map, to the eastern side of that city, there are certain countries. Now, did these wise men just come from a neighboring country uh, uh, to the nation of Israel? Not so when you consider other verses which are in this chapter. These wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Now notice in verse 2 saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now these men are not Jews. They are coming from a very far place. And actually... Their journey took them some two years for them to uh, arrive in Jerusalem. The question I want to ask is, why did they take on such a long journey? And how did they come to know about the prophecy of Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah. Because this prophecy was of interest to the Jews. But how did these men come to know about this prophecy? And what motivated them to take such a long journey? Now, well, someone may wonder to say, well, how do we know it took them such a long time? Well, there is information that is given here that when they reached Jerusalem, notice first they proclaim, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And this unsettles Herod. And surprisingly, the Jews, the people in Jerusalem, to whom these prophecies belonged to, they were alarmed when they heard these men speak in that manner. In verse 3 it says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Well, one would think uh, these people would have been excited. They would have been the first ones to know that there is such a messianic prophecy. But it wasn't so. They were surprised. They were worried. They were disturbed. Now, notice what Herod does. In verse 7, he called these wise men and he wants to inquire something. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. This was a man who was afraid about who this person born to be the king is. And so he begins to conspire to actually have the child killed. And so he asks the wise men, what time did you see the star? Now shortly we shall see why there was this so much worry in Herod. Why Jerusalem may have been troubled at the news. But here he wants to inquire something. What time did the star appear? He wanted to know that because the time the star appeared <coughs> would indicate to him how old this child should be. And he is asking this because these men are coming from a far country. Obviously the scripture doesn't record every detail, but whatever information was passed on to Herod, he knew how long it had taken them to travel. And so he wants to calculate the time when they saw the star appear. And notice when they tell him the time the star appeared, he decides to kill all the children who are two years and below. We can find that in um, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath, and sent forth. Now, he was wroth because 
he had told them after you find the child you come back and you know you you give me the information so that i can go and worship the child but after they had been warned in a dream by god of the intentions of herod uh you know they decided to use uh, another rod and here so he is angry and he does something so terrible uh, in verse 16 then herod when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under. Now, watch this. According to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So he actually um, estimates how old this child should be. From the time the wise men saw the star and they set off in their journey. And so he has an idea that the child should be two years old. But now, back to the question of what motivated these wise men to embark on such a long journey? Our interest here is these men are not Jews. But how did they get to know about the Messianic prophecy? And they were so sure of it that when they arrive in Jerusalem, they make a bold proclamation or rather inquiry. Where is he that is born? King of the Jews. They were so confident about that. And our first step should begin by trying to identify who these men are. Now, we are told they are wise men. If you read other Bible versions like the NIV, American Standard Version, the word used actually is the Magi. Now, these were astrologers, people who were given to studying stars. And the only other one place we find this wise man mentioned in the scripture is in Daniel, in the book of Daniel. And rightly so, because that is where the story begins. And we can only truly understand, actually, the message of these wise men, including the message of John the Baptist, when he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. We only appreciate its uh, full context when we go back to the book of Daniel. Let, let's just have a quick walkthrough of the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, we read about a sad incident which had taken place to the nation of uh, Israel. At that time, Jerusalem was besieged by the armies of the then, what you can call a superpower of that time, Babylon. Jerusalem had been besieged following their revolt, you know, against Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar is so furious. He destroys the temple in Jerusalem. He destroys the city. And he gives an order that certain young men who are intelligent, who are coming from uh, those families which were in the royal lines. And among the young men, who were taken captive were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, these were names which were given to them by the Babylonians, but their names were actually Daniel, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. And in chapter 1, we are told that these young men, historians, they say they must have been teenagers when they were taken captive into Babylon. They were so exceptionally wise. 
And one of them, Daniel, he also had a gift of visions and dreams. That is in Daniel chapter 1 verse 17. We are told Daniel was gifted in dreams and visions. And it so happens, as you move to Daniel chapter 2, that the king has a dream, but he has forgotten this dream. Now, you need to understand something about the nation of Babylon. There was this council of what were called wise men, and it consisted of uh, astrologers, it consisted of uh, sorcerers, it consisted of all these people who were considered wise, and they worked as a people to give advice to the king. Now, don't think of these people as having been backward people who were ignoramuses and no. These people, the astrologers, they studied stars, they studied planets, and we can actually, even to date, there is so much knowledge we borrow from what these ancient people were able, were able to discover, how they were able to calculate certain motions of the planets, you know, and all such astronomical things. As a matter of fact, in Babylon, uh, these astrologers were able to discover and observe uh, the first five planets in our solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, you know, uh, uh, and is it Saturn, uh, Saturn uh, and those other planets. But they were so superstitious about it, they believed these were gods. And they actually thought uh, those planets were stars. So they were always uh, astonished at how certain stars seem to be stationary in the heavens, and certain other stars seem to be always in motion. And at that time, the sky used to be very clear and pure. You know, there wasn't so much pollution as we have today. And they were able to notice these other stars which were in motion. And they were able to work out some calculations and see what effect these uh, uh, stars, which we know as planets, were having on Earth. But as I said, they were also superstitious about it. And they believed the movement of these planets had a certain effect and impact, you know, upon people's life here on Earth. And so it used to be that when a king wants to know or to make a certain important decision in Babylon, he would consult these astrologers and they would tell him, according to the movements of the planets, according to this position, maybe bad things are coming, so we need to work out things this way or that way. And so it goes without saying that even when he had some strange dreams, he would always call these sorcerers and these diviners and these astrologers to try to you know, uh, uh, explain what his dreams may have meant. Now, Daniel, because of being exceptionally wise, to, along with his other three friends, they were part of this group of wise men. And so this time, Nebuchadnezzar has this strange dream. He can't make out its interpretation, and actually, he has forgotten what the dream was all about. And so he calls these wise men, and he asks them to give an interpretation to what uh, the dream may have meant. But well, they say, well, O King, tell us what that could have, uh, what, what the dream was. Nebuchadnezzar says, well, forgotten. And we all know the story. You can take time and you read the chapter. He gives a stern warning that if they don't interpret, they'll be killed. And obviously these men had made a good fortune, a good living out of telling the king, tell us what the dream is, and then they would interpret and they would be rewarded. But this time things were different. And God was setting the stage for Daniel to come in the limelight. And Daniel prayed, and the revelation was given to him. And he was able to tell the king that in your dream you saw a very huge image with a head of gold breastplate and arms of silver. Its belly and its thighs were made of brass and its legs of iron, feet iron mixed with clay. And Daniel 
goes further to explain the meaning of the dream. He says, the head of God is you, O king. You've become strong, you've become mighty, but later on, another kingdom will rise. And after that second kingdom, another third kingdom shall rise. And then there'll be a fourth one, which will be as strong as iron, but it will have elements in it which are weak as clay. But in the days of this kingdom, there will be a stone cut without human hands, and it will strike all these kingdoms. And in your dream, you saw the, the, the stone started growing into a huge mountain until it covered the whole earth. And he told the king, that will be the kingdom of God that will be established on earth. So that, that, that stone will be the beginning of this kingdom and it will grow into the whole earth. And Nebuchadnezzar is so astonished, he's so surprised of how a man could go into his mind and bring out the dream that he himself had forgotten. And at this point, we begin to see the rise of Daniel. These people were pagans. And they were so excited. They, they were so surprised. The king himself worshipped Daniel, wondering how he was able to reveal such a mysterious thing. And as you move on into Daniel chapter 3, the king makes an image of gold. For well, Nebuchadnezzar was obviously excited because in the dream, the head of gold represented you, O King Nebuchadnezzar. God has raised you to rule over the nations. And while being a carnal man, all his attention was on him being the head of gold. And what we see in chapter 3, he erects an image of gold. And what does he do? He calls all the dignitaries, all the officials from the different nations. And, you know, and that image was a symbol of his power, a symbol of his divine rule. You know. But this whole episode puts in trouble three other friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because Nebuchadnezzar gives an order that they need to bow and worship that image. Well, we know the story. They refuse to do that. And he tells them you'll be thrown into the fire. They are thrown into the fire. God protects them and well, they emerge victoriously. And Nebuchadnezzar begins to, begins to witness the power of Yahweh, the God of the Jews. And so, these men, their testimony, has a serious impact on Nebuchadnezzar's life. But did he have a revelation of Yahweh being the only true God? No, not really. But he had come to see something powerful about the God of the Jews. But there was still pride in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. As we see in the fourth chapter of Daniel, in the fourth chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 4 verse 4, it says, he actually testifies himself. He, he says, I was at rest in my palace. Well, what kind of rest was that? It, it was a rest of self-accomplishment. A rest of being happy of what you've achieved. It was a rest of Nebuchadnezzar feeling proud that I've accomplished so much. And God was yet to teach him a bigger lesson. That whatever he had, whatever was put in his hands, was because the heavens rule. And so as he had all these thoughts, he has another dream. In this dream, he sees a very big, huge, immense image. A big tree. And in that dream, a voice speaks. Saying, Cut down the tree. And the tree is chopped down. And the voice says, let seven times pass over the tree. Which of course we know the seven times were seven years. 
like it is translated in other Bible versions. Let seven years pass over this tree. And he is troubled after seeing this dream. So, he calls in Daniel again. What could this mean? And Daniel is worried because the dream doesn't carry a good message. Daniel says, the tree represents you, O king. Because like that big tree, your rulership, your authority has grown to the ends, to the heavens. Now allow me just to digress a little bit here. Because uh, my friends, uh, the Jehovah Witnesses, have a, a very interesting interpretation of that. Where they, they have a very dubious interpretation of that passage. They say that tree actually it, it represented Jehovah's kingdom <laughs> because only his kingdom can reach to the, you know, high to the heavens. And permit me at this point just to, to, to read this particular passage. I take keen interest in this because it forms one of the core doctrines of the Jehovah Witnesses, which is quite very erroneous. Um, yes. That is in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 22. Daniel interprets, he says, It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. But the Jehovah Witnesses, they say, this tree, it symbolizes the universal sovereignty of Jehovah. You can find that on page, uh, should, should be page 94. In, uh, in their book, uh, Pay Attention to Daniel's Prophecy. And, and so what they do is, they say, the seven years, we have to convert them into days. So that the number of days in seven years is uh, 2,520 days, make seven years. And they don't use a calendar of one year is 365 days, but they take one year to be 360 years, the so-called prophetic year. And so they come up with 200, 2,000, rather 2,520 years. And it is further explained that since uh, this has to be Jehovah's kingdom because it's the only one which can reach to high in the heavens and to the uttermost parts of the earth, so we have to look at um, what place on earth, what kingdom represented Jehovah and of course that was Jerusalem that was the Jews and so then they look at a time when Jerusalem fell so they arrive at they pick the year 607 BC and so 607 BC you add 2520 it makes you arrive at 1914 and you and I know what Charles T. Russell uh, uh, did with that you know he started proclaiming Jesus is coming in 1914 and so one era leads to another error but um, what I don't understand is and I have discussed this with some of the senior elders in the system and all the time they tell me well they'll discuss it with me next time but next time has been as long as 15 years at the time I'm speaking this but the thing of it is Daniel clearly interpreted this that the kingdom represented Nebuchadnezzar's power now of course when you're speaking of someone's rise rise in power when you're using the word rise, conceptually, rise can only be illustrated vertically, okay? <laughs> Heavenwards. So you can't say uh, someone rose in power and conceptually wanted to go horizontal. <laughs> and that is why in this vision, as Daniel sees this tree, it grew up into the heavens. And Daniel says, uh, that is how your greatness has grown. And of course, in speaking of greatness, he conceptually illustrates it as rising high into the heavens. And this is none other than Babylon. And it would be um, a wrong exegetical formula to say uh, when something was already interpreted by Daniel, then you say, uh, actually, there's another underlying meaning to this, and this is actually Jehovah's kingdom. Well, 
would be safe to stick with what Daniel interpre interpreted, that uh, the tree represented Nebuchadnezzar's rulership and power. And he really extended his power over this whole region of Mesopotamia, what we call Iraq today, that Middle East uh, region. And that is how strong Nebuchadnezzar had grown. And Daniel was able to prophesy to him that in seven years' time, you are actually going to become insane. You will go mad. You know, and later on, we know the story of how uh, seven years passed before Nebuchadnezzar actually could regain his uh, mind. And well, later on, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he testifies of how he was humbled, how he learned about the great power of uh, Jehovah, of God. And he was able to testify that it's the heavens which actually rule. And so Nebuchadnezzar had grown to fear the God of Daniel. And as a result, Daniel also was highly respected in the ranks of the Babylonian administration. And this council of wise men, they learned to have so much respect to the prophecies of Daniel, you know, to his writings. You know, they were regarded as sacred writings, obviously, because of his accurate, you know, gift of prophecy. And, but it didn't go so, of course, after other kings came to rule, after Nebuchadnezzar died. There were other kings who came after Nebuchadnezzar, like Belshazzar. And you come to read the story of Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5. And this is a young man who has, you know, no reverence for uh, the things of God. And so um, uh, he takes the vessels of the temple uh, of the Jews, which Nebuchadnezzar had kept in a certain place in the house of his God, he takes them, he organizes a feast, and he begins to drink in these uh, golden vessels, which were meant for worship uh, um, in, in the temple of the Jews. And so he desecrated them, and uh, he wanted to use those cups to drink wine in them together with his concubines, his wives, and all that. And that hand appeared on the wall, and it wrote the words, Mene Mene Tekel, as in, and this incident was a turning point of the kingdom of Babylon. It, it, it set the wheels of prophecy in motion of what Daniel had prophesied in chapter 2, that another kingdom will arise after you. Because the very night that Daniel interpreted uh, that dream, uh, I mean that appearance of uh, the, the handwriting on the wall, the very night Belshazzar was killed, the, the Medes uh, had taken over the uh, Babylonian Empire and we see another empire you, you know uh, coming into play you know and uh, uh, that was the Middle Persian Empire now as you move on through uh, the book of Daniel as you come to uh, 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 chapter 6 you read about uh, how uh, during the times of King Darius of the Medes you know Daniel is accused of not honoring the order uh, of the king not to worship and he is thrown into the den of lions and God saves him out of that and Daniel is actually now made uh, as a very powerful uh, ruler you know in the Middle Persian Empire so you see how Daniel from one generation to another from one empire to another he is rising within the ranks and there's something people are respecting about him is that he had this divine gift. And so people begin to learn how to have fear, how, you know, uh, uh, they begin to have fear and respect for uh, uh, the prophecies uh, that he gives. And actually, as you read in other portions, we read that Daniel was actually made uh, the chief of the astrologers. These astrologers had this reverence for him. Let, let me just check where that uh, uh, verse is. That should be in Daniel chapter... There's Dan, Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. This was during the time of Babylon. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. So actually Daniel was made as the chief over all the wise men. Of, Dan, uh, of uh, Babylon. And later on again in um, uh, that should be um, um, 5 verse 11. Daniel chapter 5 verse 11. 
That was at the time when Daniel was supposed to interpret the handwriting on the wall. The last words in verse 11, it says, Thy father made the master, uh, uh, speaking of Daniel, uh, 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 okay, let me just start it from verse 11. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. So these people started fearing the God, I mean, they started fearing the God of Daniel, and they believed he had some spirits in him, you know, the spirits of the gods which were enabling him to see the future. And, uh, uh, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, hmm, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Now, I'm very much interested in this group, in this particular group, the astrologers. These men who studied the stars, and they didn't just study the stars, but they involved the divination in it. Daniel was made as a chief and the master over them. Of course, he wasn't a pagan, but because of his senior position and because of his prophetic gift, they started, you know, they revered uh, his prophecies. And we, we can see the, 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 the influence that Daniel actually had. And as you move on to chapter 7, Daniel, uh, he narrates the, the, the vision he had about the four empires to come. And he actually goes... In more detail you know he goes in more detail he, he says he saw out of the sea rose a lion which of course was Babylon and after the lion rose a bear which was Medupasia and particularly it was interesting how he describes the third empire the leopard with four heads because even the angel who gave him this vision had explained that out of the, the, I mean, the leopard, the third empire will be the, uh, will be the third kingdom, and out of it will arise four herds. And that was Alexander's Greece, Alexander the Great. After Alexander died, his four army generals, uh, Ptolemy, Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucus, the whole huge empire of Greece, which was stretching all the way from, if, I'm, if my memory serves me right, where United Kingdom is all the way to the, um, uh, to the western border of India. It was quite a very huge empire, but later on it disintegrated into uh, four empires uh, headed by these uh, four men. And Daniel was able to foretell all those particular events way before they transpired. And actually, as you come to the word Magi, Historians stress the usage of this word to the time of the, uh, yeah, should be the time of the Medes and the Persians. Now, when you look at this background, one important thing you need to notice in the visions of Daniel, the focus, the theme of what Daniel was seeing in his visions was about the coming of the kingdom of God. Not the rise of Babylon, not, not the rise of Alexander and all that. The theme, the main message is God's kingdom one day will come and it will crush all these worldly empires. And these wise men that we read of in the book of Daniel, they come from a background of revering these prophetic writings. Now, with their background of divination, their background of studying the stars, they were able to probe further to know that this stone cut without human hands, this man who appeared like a son of man in the book of Daniel chapter 7, who was brought before the ancient of days. They look at this thing and they probe further with the pagan practice of studying the stars and they know when the star will appear and they notice something in the heavens and they know this is the time now notice at the time when the star appeared it was the Roman Empire which was now ruling over the world exactly as Daniel had prophesied concerning the four empires 
And there are certain other details as you go into Daniel chapter 8, which Daniel had foretold, for example, the rise of Ep uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, the man who believed himself to be God. It was so accurate. And we see the rise of Rome, again, exactly the way he had prophesied. And so there's this curiosity. Even among the Jews, there's a certain curiosity of what is to come next. There's this speculation. The stone cut without human hands. Is this the time it has to come now? Because all prophecies are in place. 